Good morning, everyone. Um, I am, uh, as I said, Livy Erickson, and I am really, really excited to be back in Scotland. Uh, 2007 was a really fun year for me. It was almost 10 years ago. Uh, it was the year that I first came to Scotland. I was doing an exchange in Dunfermline, and I also started my journey as a computer scientist at that point. I took my first computer science class in 2007. Uh, it was the first time that I had been able to really start seeing the power of software and start creating things myself. Uh, at 16 years old, though, my computer programming experience consisted of a couple of Java applications, and my web development experience was customizing my MySpace page. Uh, 2007, I had just joined Facebook, and my career aspirations at the time were pretty simple. I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. Uh, flash forward to college, turns out Jedi knighthood is not really a standard career path, so I settled on the next best thing and decided to become a computer science major. At this time, I had this new freedom, though. I wasn't limited to what I was learning in the classroom, although I was getting a really good background in how computers worked and how I could start writing applications uh, for computers. And I wrote some pretty terrible C code and some really unstable programs in college. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with that when I graduated. Uh, I love being a developer, but I still thought being a Jedi Knight would be a little bit more fun. Uh, it might not surprise you, I also really liked computer games and science fiction. And for some reason, I never really made that connection in my head at the time. And so I moved out to San Francisco in 2013 to start my full-time job as a program manager at Microsoft. And I was working on mobile applications, and I was learning a lot. But everyone I met in Silicon Valley seemed to have this burning passion to do more with what they were building. And I set out on my own journey to find that for myself. I wanted to go home and be really passionate about something and be building things all the time, creating new, new software, and figuring out new ways to play with technology. And so I started looking at what was out there, and I saw a YouTube video. And now I don't normally tell people, yes, you should make career-changing, life-altering decisions based off of something you watch on YouTube, but that's exactly what I did. Uh, I saw a YouTube video about the Oculus Rift developer kit, and it was the first time that I had realized how close science fiction was to becoming reality. And so I decided then and there, I want to learn more about VR, I want to become a virtual reality developer, whatever that means. So I pulled up my browser and searched how to become a VR developer, uh, started playing around with some of the tools that I had learned about, and I went to my first virtual reality meetup. And in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of meetup groups you can go to, a lot of ways to connect with people working on different technologies. And I showed up at the meetup group, and I was early, and everyone was still setting up, and I didn't really know what to expect, and I had never tried any virtual reality other than the Google Cardboard headset. And someone looked at me looking pretty lost and said, do you want to give this a try? And I said, yeah. So I put on this, this big headset. It was bigger than the one that I have here. I wasn't really sure what to expect. The screen was black. I just kind of had this darkness over my face. And he hands me these controllers and turns on the demo. And this is an actual picture of my first virtual reality experience. And it was a Star Wars lightsaber training demo. For me, you can probably understand at this point why that was such a big deal. I was able to experience a dream that I had since I was a tiny, tiny kid about being a Jedi Knight through this technology. And if I hadn't already been sold on the YouTube video, I would have been sold then. I was immediately struck by how powerful this medium was as a new technology for being able to not just live out and create environments that were previously limited to science fiction and kind of an observer point of view, but for the, the promise and the potential of virtual reality as a platform and a technology for the future to fundamentally change how we interact with technology and software applications. Uh, so I went home and I immediately bought my, D, my very own DK2 and started building software. And about three months after that, I was hired as Microsoft's uh, virtual and augmented reality developer evangelist in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, if you want to be surrounded by way more virtual reality than you ever thought a single person could tweet about, that's me on Twitter. Uh, if you haven't been able to tell, I like VR a lot. 
So today, I'm really excited to talk to you about a particular area of virtual reality that I find particularly fascinating and really influential in the terms of what virtual reality applications will look like over the next several years. I, I always have wanted to get closer to technology and live in those science fiction worlds, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about enabling and empowering users to become a part of an operating system or become a part of an application and fundamentally change what the idea of the user experience is for a user. Uh, and so my job as a developer evangelist is to get really excited about VR, talk to all of you about it, and that's not really a big problem for me because I get really excited talking about VR. So I'm gonna try to make sure that I keep myself a little bit grounded, talk a little bit slowly, but I'll probably speed up and get really excited to show you some things. Uh, my talk does have a couple of videos of VR experiences and demos. They may be a little bit uh, uncomfortable if you're extremely sensitive to motion sickness, but I will tell you before I bring those up on the screen a little bit later on in the talk. So with that, let's get into it. Why virtual reality? So before we dive into the specifics about browser-based VR, let's take a second to consider why virtual reality at all. In 2012, Oculus broke Kickstarter records with their headset, and Valve and HTC announced their own version of a virtual reality uh, headset last year. Between those devices, the Sony PlayStation VR that's being released in October, the five million cardboard headsets that Google shipped already, virtual reality is at a point now where it has never been before. And it brings this entire new availability to a platform that in the past was really limited to research institutions. In the 90s, in order to build for VR or to have a VR device, you needed to spend about $40,000 for a computer that could run a device uh, that was you know, really big and bulky and had you tethered in. But we've been working on improving that technology over the past several years, and now it's something that is a wonderful fashion accessory and is a lot more portable and powered by something as small as your smartphone in your pockets. So what are some of the benefits of virtual reality? I love this picture because it really shows a new type of relationship between technology and how we perceive technology today and how technology is changing kind of the world we live in in our environment. And you'll often hear virtual reality talked about this way and talked about as an empathy machine. Compared to more traditional computing platforms, virtual reality has benefits about being able to engage the spatial part of our brain and that reptilian part of our brain that we've learned how to interact with things in our environment over the past several millennia. We haven't really come up with an interface that's better than ourselves and our hands for interacting with uh, information in our physical world, and virtual and augmented reality begins to blend our digital world into that physical world and create new ways of experiencing that information. For the first time, we're able to really transform data and software applications into something that we can stand inside of and something that we can walk around in and experience stories told from someone else's perspective as if they're happening to us. We get to experience things for the first time instead of just observing them when it comes to software applications, and that's really, really powerful. So generally speaking, when we talk about today's virtual reality ecosystem, we're going to talk about headsets that fall into one of three categories. This is a general overview of virtual reality as it exists today, and it's not meant to be a kind of comprehensive uh, exploration of every potential way that you can build a VR system, but it'll give you a good understanding. I wanna take a second and ask, how many of you have tried some kind of VR headset already? Yes, oh my gosh, that's so exciting because as I, as I do these talks and I come and talk to new people about VR, that number gets bigger every single time I ask. Who, has anyone in here built something for VR yet? Okay, a couple of you, great. Well, hopefully after you kind of walk through this today with me, you'll understand why I'm really passionate about it and you'll be inspired to go try building some things of your own. Uh, so the first that you'll see um, when you refer to today's virtual reality devices is mobile VR. Uh, mobile VR uses, as I mentioned, your smartphone as a display, and I've got an example of one of these right here. This is the Samsung Gear VR, and it's powered by one of Samsung's phones. So you can see here, I have a smartphone. This acts as the display and the processor for running uh, mobile VR applications. You can download apps from the App Store, stick it into your headset, and go. 
Uh, this is really powerful and has been a really interesting shift for making virtual reality more accessible because of the fact that so many people already own phones that can power these types of devices. Um, so at its core, the mobile VR headsets, they generally rely on the phone to do just about all of the processing, all of the display. Uh, but you do have some internal sensors in these that can measure rotation and figure out where your head is looking and turned. Um, but it's also a little bit less powerful than something you would expect that would be connected to a desktop. At its very minimum, a mobile VR headset is a set of lenses that will distort uh, an application that's split in half to render it stereoscopically. But as I mentioned, with Google Cardboard, you can make that out of a cardboard box or a little piece of plastic. You don't need too much. I think someone over there knows. They've done some stuff with cardboard. So moving into higher end uh, virtual reality experiences, we start to look at desktop VR. And these are VR systems that are powered, as they sound, off of their de off a desktop PC, and they're running pretty standard computer applications. The head-mounted display, uh, or HMD, is a separate display and usually has um, some additional components. So something like the HTC Vive, which is pictured here, comes with room-scale tracking and hand controllers so that you can see and interact with things in your environment. These generally are more powerful and immersive experiences because you're able to capture the full capabilities of a desktop graphics card or the processors. Um, but the delta between a mobile phone VR headset and a desktop VR headset will likely converge in the future and become less of a substantial difference. And then lastly, what you have kind of bringing those converging ideas together are standalone devices. And like they sound, these are standalone, self-contained devices that contain everything needed to run and process a virtual reality experience on the device itself. Uh, this is a picture of the Pico Neo, which I haven't tried myself, but it's got a really interesting um, way that it's been built in that all of the processing power for this headset runs off of the phone, uh, not the phone, the controller. It doesn't need a phone, that's the benefit of it. Um, and you can also take the headset apart and put it into the desktop and just use it as a desktop display too. So it's an adaptable standalone device that comes in an all-in-one package for virtual reality or can be adapted to take advantage of higher power computers. I expect we'll see more of these at some point in the future, probably not too long from now. So looking at all of that, let's think about the platforms that these applications run on and think about why virtual reality on the web is such an interesting and compelling use case for VR technologies. A lot of the benefits that exist for web applications today also apply to VR, such as running one app everywhere. Right now, some people have used VR and some people haven't. Um, who here owns a VR headset? Okay, so there are a few people in the audience, but when you compare that to the people who have tried VR, there's kind of a big gap there still. So right now, we're really at an interesting point where developing good immersive content sometimes means we're still looking at a 2D screen and sometimes means we're viewing things immersively in a head-mounted display or another VR system. And one of the benefits of a VR on the web is being able to build applications that are responsive to the devices that you're building for. And I'll go into this a little bit more later when I show you the code. With WebVR and the virtual reality, virtual reality on the browser, you're able to let the browser handle a lot of the different devices that you may run into. Um, advancements being made on the Firefox and Chromium browsers, as well as some mobile browsers, are letting web developers use the browser to handle all of the things around orientation, the different types of devices that you may run into. It's not going to matter to you as a developer if you're running on a phone or a desktop, if you're using VR mode or not VR mode. You're going to be able to query the browsers to get all of those, that information to you so that you don't have to build all of these checks into your applications to figure out how to change your app based on the type of device that you're looking at. Uh, and so I'll go into a little bit more detail about the specifics between the Web VR API and the VR polyfills in just a minute and how they're enabling uh, kind of responsive content across today's VR ecosystem. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna go into another reason of why this is really important, which is open access to content. So I don't know about any of you, but if I wanna read a news story, I'm not gonna go download a specific app for that news story. And as we're looking to virtual reality as a new platform and medium for creating experiences, we'll start to see where traditional distribution may not be the right model for VR experiences. Uh, for investigative journalism, like I said, we wouldn't generally download an application for each individual news story that we wanted to read. And we browse through a ton of different types of content on the web every day. 
And it makes sense that we can have a platform that enables us to do this in VR. Especially because virtual reality applications are so story driven, sometimes those stories are not stories that some people want to have distributed widely. And the open web as a platform for VR means that no one is policing the content that's going through those app stores and making that subject to approval, which is actually something that some VR companies have run into already. And then one of my favorites as a developer is that with the web VR um, ecosystem, you don't need to learn new tools. When I first started learning VR development and learning about how to develop for 3D environments, that was a pretty big learning curve in and of itself. And it's really nice to be able to use languages and tools that you're already familiar with when you start building for VR. So let's dive in a little bit deeper into understanding the VR web and the elements that make up today's browser-based VR ecosystem. Broadly speaking, when we think about the VR web, it's not a specific platform or framework. It's this idea that our browsers are growing and learning how to adapt to VR and 3D environments. So at its core, we'll start by looking at the experimental web VR API and then dive into the tool and the, the ecosystem that's evolving around that, eco, or that API to make virtual reality on the web super straightforward and really fun to develop for. So at the core of the VR web is the aptly named Web VR API. This is an experimental uh, effort that's collaborative, collaborative between uh, Google, Mozilla, and a few other smaller VR companies working on web-based virtual reality. And as I mentioned, the Web VR API offloads all of, the, um, all of the, the stuff that's required to figure out what types of headsets you're using, what type of applications you're running on, from the browser, and passes in that, just that information about the headsets into your application itself. Um, it allows the application to receive all of the information that the headset is using. So as a developer, you worry about the content, not about the devices. Right now, uh, the WebVR API is supported in Firefox Nightly and a few specific builds of the Chromium browser. And there's a couple of other proprietary browsers that I'll get into in a little bit that are using this kind of technology to change even more about how we think of the browser today. So under the hood, the WebVR specification breaks down virtual reality devices into a number of different components so that the hardware can easily be accessed by web applications. Some of these interfaces are related specifically to the devices and are generally made up of a VR display kind of core component. For a desktop VR device, this might be something like an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive that's plugged into the computer. But for mobile, this will be information about the phone. And this, all of this information is passed through to the browser through the WebVR API to talk about the state of the, the headset at a given time or what the parameters are for the field of view and the size of the display that you're working with and how to render that camera stereoscopically so that it's comfortable for a user to wear. Uh, looking on top of that in the actual implementation, the WebVR library built with uh, 3JS in mind as a kind of developer ecosystem really simplifies a lot of the interactions using the VR, WebVR API. Uh, so developing for WebVR right now is relatively simple. It reuses a lot of the libraries that are already being used for uh, 3D development with, WebVR, uh, with 3JS and things like Babylon. And there's a couple of specifics, such as the WebVR boilerplate code, that makes this even easier because it includes all of this into one library and packages it up really nicely. Uh, what this does, and I'll walk through an example of this in an application that I wrote in just a couple minutes, uh, but what it does is it allows you to apply VR controls directly to a camera in a WebGL scene. The VR effect will tell it how it should render that split screen view based on the information about the headset. And a web VR manager will handle moving in and out of web, or web VR mode for you so that you don't have to constantly be querying for changes in the display uh, interface. And then on top of all of that, the web VR polyfill provides this implementation for mobile browsers that don't have web VR supported natively. So the fun thing is, is that everyone in here can pull out their phone and kind of look at these browsers now and go to a web VR application and start to play and see some of these apps in action without having to do anything special or download any specific type of app. So one of the tools that was built on top of web VR uh, is A-Frame, which is a markup styled language that has a really powerful entity component system to extend the built-in functionality of the language and provide support for 2D and 3D objects that you may put into a scene. Um, 
This is developed by the Moz VR team over at Mozilla. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this. But the really cool thing about this is that starting the application is as simple as going in and creating uh, an A scene element, filling it up with 3D components or 2D components, and importing the A-frame library just on top of all of that. Another tool that's evolved around the web VR and developing for it is Visor, which is a visual node-based programming for VR websites. This allows users to collaborate and work together on web VR applications and view changes in real time to break down all of the different 3D components that they're looking at into node and to different nodes and make changes to those in real time. And lastly, while not strictly a browser-based implementation of web VR, the benefits of game engines for virtual reality are pretty um, are pretty popular for a creation tool in that they build um, out this baseline layer of physics, lighting, a lot of the rendering they can build to a variety of different devices. And most recently, as of about like a week and a half ago, uh, someone's, uh, the Jump Gaming has released a web VR plugin for exporting games that are built in the Unity game engine to run uh, in web VR mode with their WebGL and HTML5 export. Uh, so what this does is it lets you use traditional game engines to build out really powerful, immersive, browser-based experiences, which is great for things like doing demos of a VR application um, without having people, requiring people to download and install specific small snippets of your app. So at this point, I'm going to keep talking, but you also get to see uh, so I'm going to walk through a couple of samples that I've built using WebVR and A-Frame and show you a little bit more in depth about what it actually looks like to be building a virtual reality uh, website. So this is the point where I do want to let everyone know um, there are a couple of videos in this section that will have a, quite a bit of head movement around. Uh, when you're using VR and viewing that kind of on a 2D screen, you'll see just how much our heads really do move around at a given, uh, at a given time. Uh, so if you're really sensitive to motion sickness, just I would advise looking away from the screen for some of those videos. But to start with, this is one of the first applications that I built using WebVR to showcase the potential of using WebVR as a platform for integrating in our applications with the existing web content that exists today. Uh, so these are pictures that were taken from the International Space Station, viewed as if you were on the International Space Station in an outer space. Um, so you'll see a similar program in just a couple minutes written in A-frame, but this one I really thought was interesting because it showcases how powerful it is to be able to integrate VR experiences with content that already exists on the web today. A second demo, and this is a video, so let's see if it works is something that I built to visualize Excel data. I don't know about any of you, but my favorite part of my day is not generally looking at charts and spreadsheets. Uh, but there's a lot of powerful data that's out there, and I wanted to build an application that could showcase some of this data in a more interesting and kind of natural way. So for me, I built a spreadsheet that showcased the cost of living in price per square feet of different places in the United States, and graphed that in 3D so I could stand there and walk around in the scene that I had built. And San Francisco is very, very large for any, anyone from the Bay Area probably can relate to the feeling a little bit intimidated by that graph. Um, but what was really interesting and kind of inspiring about this project is just thinking of the potential around different ways to visualize data that before VR and kind of immersive content was not what I wanted to be spending time kind of looking at. And it also wasn't stuff I remembered really well. If someone kind of sat there and said, oh, yeah, the average cost per square foot of living in San Francisco is $730 per square foot, I might remember that number, but it's probably not very likely that it would stick with me. But when I can stand there and see how tall that number is compared to other places, it makes a much bigger impact because that's how I'm used to experiencing the world. Uh, so I'm going to switch over here to kind of show you what the code behind that, this, this application with, the, with respect to the VR content is. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Perfect. Uh, so what I've done is I built the Excel parsing part of this on .NET, and that's uh, a little bit less interesting than the VR component. So I'm going to show you this one file that I wrote that handles all of the rendering of that graph in 3JS. Uh, so what I have here is a very large paint canvas function. I apologize for 
maybe probably should break this down into a couple of smaller functions, but uh, you can see here at the start, we've got that VR, uh, or we're, we're using a standard WebGL renderer. And this is if you've programmed in 3JS or used uh, any kind of JavaScript 3D development library, this is what's going to render our application to the scene on the browser. Uh, I then create a canvas, which is a, web, a WebGL context canvas, which is everything that we're going to add our 3JS elements to. And then I create a 3.js scene. Once I do that, I'm going to put in a camera. So I have something that we can use to see everything that we're rendering in that scene. And I'm going to just set a couple of the different uh, settings of this. So by default, I'm using a perspective camera, which is what is going to render just in the browser as a standard window if I'm not using a VR mode. And I'm going to apply a couple of things. I'm going to raise the camera up so that when I put it on, I'm not just kind of like stuck to the ground. That's not how I interact with the physical world, and it's not how I should interact with the virtual world either. And then I'm going to apply VR controls to this camera, which, as I mentioned, is what's going to come in from the browser and get that information about where I'm looking and where I'm going. So with that, um, we're going to also look at the VR effect, and we're going to apply those VR effects to the renderer. So it will know that when we are moving our head, we need to render our scene appropriately. After that, we're going to create a manager specifically to control that effect. And that's really all of the VR specific code that comes into this application. So it's about six lines of code there. Uh, once I do that, it's pretty straightforward. I parse the JSON um, objects that I've created here from the Excel graph. And I create some cubes that are going to take that information and paint them into our 3JS scene. I move into kind of getting some text geometry to make the labels in. But again, these are all things that are available just using 3JS regardless of whether or not you're in a VR mode or not. And I'm going to set some of those positions too. Uh, I do some logging. Got to make sure I'm fixing everything if there's any bugs. And then I add all of those elements to our scene and repeat that for each of the different pieces of data. Once I do that, I give us a, a ground to stand on. It's a little bit disoriented to just be floating in uh, space in VR, just as it is kind of to be floating in space, I would imagine, uh, in the physical world. And I position that all in so that I have a kind of something to ground myself with. And then I have this little if statement here that just says, if it's in VR mode, render it in VR mode. If not, render it normally. Uh, for this one, there's not really any animation that I do for the information itself. But I do want to control or make sure that I'm updating the controls so that every time I'm moving my head, my application is getting that browser information and applying it to the camera that's in our scene. Um, when I do that and request the animation frame and animate it, that's pretty much everything that I need to have in my application to be able to apply the headset to everything I'm doing in the camera. Uh, I also do a couple of um, movement functions here just so I can walk around within the scene using the keyboard. Uh, but really, this whole thing is, I want to say it's about two to 300 lines of code. It's not a lot of work that I need to be doing on top of everything because the web VR libraries kind of bring that all in and off offload a lot of what I need to be doing to have that VR application working. So let's see if I can quickly switch back into the slides. So a similar application like the one that I showed you, this one is built off of A-Frame. And I built this this week when I got here because I wanted a way that I could show some of the pictures that I was taking here in a kind of fun and immersive way. And you can see this on your own phones and look at VR mode if you want to go to livy.link slash A-Frame.js. And you can see what it looks like kind of rendered over there with the split screen effect on mobile using the VR polyfill. Now, I mentioned that A-Frame is built on top of WebVR, and I want to take a little bit of a poll. Uh, does anybody have a guess how many lines of code this takes to write? Shout it out, or if not, I'm going to do a higher or lower. 60? 16. Seven. <laughs> um, so the amount of code that I wrote for this application, 19. So very close. Um, and you can't see that. So let me get that on the screen so you can actually see what I'm talking about here. Um, so this whole website here, using A-Frame, was built with these 19 lines of code. And some of them are just the HTML tags. So you know you could probably reduce that down to, to be a little bit less. 
Um, and because it's built on top of WebVR and uses 3JS on all of the underlying components for this, you can customize these and add really complex animations and uh, different experiences around this application. So what I did here is I used the entity component system to load in a bunch of different pictures that I had taken um, and applying those to different 3D things in the scene. You'll notice that right at the top is where I import the A-frame JavaScript library. And then I can use this markup that's prepended with the A tags for all of these different pictures and giving it kind of an immersive sky that surrounds me. And all of the pictures can kind of be placed around nicely. So showing what that looks like, bring another window over. Right here, I don't have a desktop headset plugged into my laptop, so it's rendering everything just as a regular context. And I can use my mouse, and I can look around, and I can see these pictures, and I put this environment around that I took up on the Royal Mile uh, yesterday. And I can look around, and I kind of have this interesting experience of seeing these pictures that I took this week as if I'm actually standing here, which is really, I think, a more fun way to kind of show off some pictures. And it's a really easy way to do it so that if you're looking at this on a phone, you can have that same effect of standing kind of in the middle of the Royal Mile while you're looking at the different pictures that were taken. As I mentioned, this is really simple. You saw the code kind of behind this. It's like 19. And that's being generous because I like to put everything out on different lines. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to try now, you should go to this link on your phone and you can see how when you're moving your phone around, it's going to grab you. I see a couple of people have tried that and can see. Um, but it will work regardless of whether or not you have a headset. So even if you just pull out your phone, you can kind of look around and where you move your phone, it's going to be capturing all of that information about the orientation of the phone, the rotation, and applying that into the scene and updating those camera controls. Let's get back over to PowerPoint. Nope, still not PowerPoint. Where'd it go? Um, so lastly, I wanted to show another video, and this one is another one that's going to get a little bit wobbly, um, of a Unity exported project to work with WebVR through their WebGL exporter. So I'm going to go ahead and play the video here. This was not written uh, natively in, in um, the WebVR code. I used the Unity game engine and their environment editor to build this out. But when I exported it using the WebVR plugin, it gives me a WebGL canvas and a couple of different options for playing this application. Um, and so you can see here that this, this sits in the browser and it's a, it's a uh, WebGL canvas and all of those transforms from the headset that was plugged in uh, were applied here so that when I was moving my head around, I was able to see everything and show people kind of online what I'm working on without having them have to go to install specific things. I don't have to build different packages based off of whether or not I'm building for an Oculus or a Vive. Uh, the WebGL export does not at the moment work on mobile, so this doesn't have the same benefit of working across the whole spectrum of VR devices. Um, but as more and more kind of effort goes into building out these tools and everything for both the game engines and for WebVR, we'll start to see more examples of applications that kind of blend through what's traditionally thought of a desktop app or a mobile VR app and really start adapting to a lot of different contexts. So looking ahead and thinking outside of the box, there's a lot of potential that browsers have in becoming incredibly powerful tools for the future of immersive technology. Uh, so I'm going to think of, and just talk for a few minutes here briefly about some of the things that I'm really excited to see in the context of browser-based VR. So I mentioned you know, custom browsers. One of the really interesting applications of web VR technology is done by a VR company called Altspace VR. And they have a internal browser that uses web VR to do holographic applications within a VR application itself. So you put on your headset and you load up a web page, and all of the stuff that you saw coming through for web VR is going to be rendered 3D in the space around you. So you already have examples of VR applications using web VR to create augmented 
augmented reality applications. And you can start to see how this is creating a really interesting ecosystem around what we can do and how we can interact with different things in our virtual and physical environments. So one of the areas I'm particularly excited about with what we're able to do for visualizations is big data and virtual reality. You saw my little project that was visualizing Excel data in VR. And when you can think of the applications of taking cloud computing and that, what that enables for big data and processing that, you start to see really interesting ways where we can look at this data in new ways and make really better decisions about the data that we're gathering. And we can see links between things that we maybe haven't been able to see before as data is put behind a 2D screen. Um, imagine being able to take this data and create simulations built off of that data to enact some really powerful change. Like one, um, one project that I did with A-Frame was visualizing ocean pollution uh, from the perspective of something that lives under the sea. And it's really powerful because we can sit and hear stories about the ways that we have impacts on the environment or how things change just even about our planet over time. And we don't really always internalize that because it's something we're hearing about or observing, not something that we're experiencing. And when you bring in big data to virtual reality and think of new ways that we can be taking that information and that data and the information that we're finding about the entire, basically the entire world and bringing that into a new way for us to experience that, you start to see where there's a lot of potential for some really powerful data-driven applications. Another area that I'm really interested in are building smarter applications. Right now, if I put on the headset, the only difference that's going to be between what I see when I put on that A-frame site and what someone in the, one of you guys see or girls see is the height. Like I stand a little bit taller and I may be a different height than someone, but ultimately it's the same application. And what I'm really fascinated by is using the principles of machine learning and bringing that into virtual reality and see how we can build environments that adapt to us as individuals. And they can learn about our, our, the way that we interact with digital environments to help us understand better how we interact with other people in the, the world around us as well. We can also start to look at some predictive technologies for virtual reality applications, which are really interesting in the context of gaming, but also in the context of healthcare and education and being able to build smart platforms that people can be inside and have that adapt to their individual learning styles or their behavior styles. Uh, and in our connected world, being able to bring in more and more of those devices in the physical world back to our virtual environments will also show a lot of potential for the ways that we can build out really complicated environments that teach us a lot about what's going on. As we continue to utilize information about ourselves through biometric data, through uh, the internet connected appliances that we use, smart devices, we'll start to see ways that the digital and physical world blend together either to impact a virtual environment or using a virtual environment to help uh, solve problems in the physical world. And this is all like doable because of the power of the internet and the browser based technologies that we have today. Uh, so with that, there are still a few challenges around bringing virtual reality out kind of to the web at large. Um, right now, there's a lot of promise and a lot of momentum, but there are still some challenges around performance and optimization. And this is true of browser-based VR technology, but also true of VR in general. Comfort is a really big thing in virtual reality. So being able to optimize our applications so that they're able to be used in a really comfortable way for everybody is something that a lot of companies are working on right now for encouraging wider adoption. Um, and then within kind of some specifics to the browser, uh, visual editing tools for 3D environments are really, really helpful in terms of building out something that we, you're going to stand in and see and interact with. Uh, so building up those visual editing tools is another really key area for the success of browser-based VR technology. Uh, and lastly, experimenting with cross-platform design is something that will have to be done really widely, again, across the industry. But when you're building applications that can move between desktop or mobile devices, figuring out design patterns and kind of paradigms that will link those together and create really good experiences regardless of the type of device that you're on is something that will also be key. Of course, there's only so much that I can cover on stage now, and VR is one of those things where it's a lot harder to talk about and describe. Uh, so I've been putting together as many resources and links as I can for virtual reality, uh, both browser-based VR technologies and kind of around design, understanding the platforms in general. Um, 
But I have to say, and I want to just leave you with this, is that this is a particular application of web technology that's really, really important to me. Being able to democratize the availability of immersive experiences is really, really key for the adoption of this technology. And being able to enable creators to work on different applications is also really critical. Um, and so with that, if you want to learn more about any of the things that I talked about, this link has a bunch of resources that I've compiled. I also have a blog that I've put up and should be going live just about any minute now that contains all of the resources in the slides, links to the GitHub repositories. Everything that I showed you today here is uh, open source. And so with that, I want to say that I am really, really excited for the future of what a browser becomes. Like right now, when I think of web browser, you know, you think Think of what you run a lot of your applications on. You, I still think, you know, oh, Facebook. But you also start to see that there's a lot more power coming from that. And I'm really excited because today there's a, and tomorrow there are some really amazing speakers who are going to share their own expertise on the entire web ecosystem. And I'm really excited to see how that's all coming together to bring kind of the future of computing in this really really accessible and easy to understand way. Uh, so with that, I want to leave you um, with just saying thank you so much for having me uh, come talk to you about all of this. I will be around. If you have never tried VR and you would really like to, just come find me sometime over the next couple of days, and I'd be more than happy to give you a demo. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, come find me. Reach out to me on Twitter. As I said, I love VR, and I love talking about VR, and I'm really excited and passionate to share this with all of you. So thank you again. And I know I'm really looking forward to everything that the rest of this conference has in store. So thank you. Woo!